thank you, bald guy from Rygar, for all that you've taught me. The skills, the new powers, and especially that nifty astral projection trick, so that I could appear at PAX East even though I'm still technically trapped here in Wario's woods. <laughs> I like that movie, too. Lay it on me, bald guy from Rygar. Oh, good. I was wondering how we were going to work that into this particular chapter. Ah, yes. That is a difficult one. But you're right. It must be done. Retro gaming, classic gaming, golden age, old school. So many names for one simple idea. Old games and games that seek to capture the spirit of old games. Gaming is really the only pastime, hobby, or art form where appreciating stuff from before the most recent iteration needs some special classification. No one calls themselves a retro reader just because they prefer Charles Dickens to David Sedaris. Then again, old books or paintings or movies have never been especially difficult to come by, at least not in any era that you or I have ever lived in. They're always out there if you're looking for them. Gaming, on the other hand, especially console gaming, is a realm where the continued flow and availability of content is still 99% controlled by publishers and console manufacturers, unless you choose to wade into the muddy ethical waters of emulation or even outright piracy. Finding and maintaining classic games and the devices to run them is an effort in and of itself, wholly apart from just playing them. Don't we all? Of course, it's also not a very accurate descriptive term. Let's be honest, retro gaming is pretty much a shorthand for Gen X nostalgia about video games. It only seems like some special phenomenon because it's new. The first waves of Generation NES is finally old enough to be legitimately nostalgic about stuff. If you ever wanted a symptom of how much the information age is speeding up our psychological ages, this would be it. Our parents' generation were in their late 40s before they started to wax longingly about their childhoods. Our grandparents didn't until they were our grandparents. But me? I only just turned 30, and yet my earlier life of 8-bit graphics and Castle Grayskull seems like some ancient half-remembered dream. And I know I'm not the only one. Dear God, can you imagine how old we'll be when we're actually old? Present company excluded, of course. And so today, retro gaming, or whatever we want to call it, is an increasingly huge part of the business. It's the lifeblood that keeps most independent game stores in business, fueling a collector's market for rare titles and a booming trade in emulation consoles and conversion equipment. It's also an infinitely bigger than expected revenue stream for the current game biz. Compilation packs of classics or big sellers and download services like Virtual Console, Xbox Live Arcade, and PlayStation Online have made the Golden Age a golden ticket for microtransaction moolah. It's also had a wholly unexpected effect, a revival. While there's always been a niche market for throwbacks and reminders of days past, people have been hacking old games to assemble newfangled tributes as long as the capabilities existed. Around a decade ago, the whole scene exploded. Fan-programmed retro demakes of current-gen games became an internet sensation, and a lot of the big guys took serious notice. Nintendo sent the Mario Brothers back to their side-scrolling roots and scored a huge hit. The next-gen reboot of Bionic Commando was one of this gen's most prominent failures, but the retro revamp of the original was a smash. Sega took a couple swings with Sonic the Hedgehog because, hey, why not at this point? Capcom and Konami took things one step further and used old-school sound and graphics engines, too. And the indie art gaming world found a new favorite toolkit, with titles like Braid and Cave Story using the retro aesthetic to express an original vision. Yeah, the blue shell suit was kind of a pain in the balls, too. Overall, the power-up management was much better than the one on the Wii. You know, the rumor is they might be bringing back the raccoon tail or even the full tanuki suit in the next game. All in all, if you're anything like me, i.e. you're just fine with modern gaming, excited to see where it's going, and always eager to embrace change, yet still operating under a comparative baseline that it's been pretty much downhill from right about here, these are good days. The retro aesthetic has pulled lost souls back to their proper track, raised old pals from the dead, and given me almost more self-consciously time-displaced t-shirts than I know what to do with. And yet, the question must be asked, is there a downside to this? 
Let's be honest, for all the arguments that can be made, I should know, I'm about to make them, about repurposing an outdated aesthetic for contemporary use and heritage preservation, let's be honest with ourselves. Mega Man 9 and 10, while awesome, are not about lofty artistic goals. They're about us wanting to ensconce ourselves womb-like in a reminder of happier days spent with the original games, and Capcom wanting to sell that experience back to us. And while I think there's an argument to be made that New Super Mario Bros. Wii did, to a certain extent, move the medium forward, most throwbacks like it definitely don't. And doing so wouldn't even have made the top 10 list of Nintendo's reasons for making it. Also, for every braid that uses not only the aesthetic but the storytelling techniques and shared mythology of old-school platformers to explore the meanings of the medium itself, there's a hundred other lazy indie games that are little more than reskins of Mario, Contra, Castlevania, or whatever else with a different art scheme. Hell, one of the main reasons Cave Story felt so fresh was that the game it was most prominently inspired by, Blaster Master, is kind of obscure. Look, you all know me by now, I won't lie or shy away from who and what I am. I'd happily see the 8-16-bit to 16 -bit retro game ephemera hang above the medium forever, dwarfing all other growth and expansion of the medium with the sheer magnitude of its chip-tuned, pixelated glory. But realistically, I've got to recognize that while it'd be great for me, it'd be kind of stagnating and crummy for the medium of gaming as a whole. Creative industries like gaming need to grow and embrace the new if they are to continue being relevant, and it's very conceivable that if enough gamers, especially nostalgic adult gamers who have more money to spend than the younger ones, are content with reliving their own youth over and over, more companies will follow that path to easy money rather than the path of innovation. My willingness to keep playing 2D Mario revivals shouldn't be depriving the next overthinker-to-be from something fresh that they might love just as much. I've brought this up before, but this is a big part of what helped cripple the comic industry in the United States. Once publishers realized it was easier to make money selling older, deeper-pocketed fans the same stuff they'd always liked back in the day than coming up with new stuff to get new readers, they did. And if you want to see just where that goes in terms of short-term good versus really, really bad ends, go read Frank Miller's original Dark Knight book, and then read the second one. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Fortunately, I don't think we're quite there yet, possibly because the nostalgic retro gamer community has the good sense to act in moderation, but more likely because we're just not as much of a market force as the web can occasionally make us feel like we are. Indeed, the retro gaming explosion has happened in tandem with what's turning out to be one of the most creative and expansive period in gaming in a long time. Controllers redefined, whole new platforms emerging, the rise of Steam, and the two markets seem to be complementing rather than fighting one another. And as much truth as there is in the idea of retro gaming trend as nerd nostalgia, you can't really deny that it's part and parcel of the medium's current focus on expanding its artistic horizons at pace with its technological ones. Part of this is the often noted plateau being reached in terms of the old graphics arms race. Think about it. When's the last time anyone outside of Crytek was trying to sell a game exclusively on how powerful the graphics engine was? We've reached a point in the realms of realism and detail that they're no longer surprising, and much like what happened in the development of the painting arts, concepts like abstraction, surrealism, and minimalism, which had always existed in one form or another, are getting a second look. Yes, the original driving force behind the present pop art fixation on pixelated art and model-confined designs was good old-fashioned nerd memory porn at first. But a lot of the work it inspired is grounded in the solid artistic principle of abstraction. Part of the reason that old-school games slid more easily into gonzo visual creativity was that the limits of pixel art forced visuals to be rendered in an abstract manner, and having that abstraction spread through an entire game's design unified the myriad elements into a cohesive vision. You ever notice how the monsters and cheap effects in old black-and-white B-movies look more real than the same kind of cheap effects in color B-movies? That's the same principle. Because black and white is itself an unreal abstraction, it unifies the real actors and sets with phony monsters by making them all abstractly monochromatic. To use the most famous gaming example possible, what could possibly make a classical ethnic Americana working class archetype, a European style fairy tale princess, and a Japanese mythological cryptid fit together smoothly, making them all out of the same blocks and limited color palette? And on the control side, I think we're finally learning that not every game needs to use every tool in the box, any more than every soup needs every ingredient. How many classical franchises faltered in past generations because we tried unsuccessfully to make them grow up from 2D to 3D, only to find that they lost their souls in the transition? Contra didn't work in 3D. Sonic, eh, let's not go there again. The point is, we made them 3D because we felt everything had to go that way. But now, in hindsight, we've realized that locking the movement into two dimensions isn't inherently a bad thing. The recent 2D Contras have kicked ass. Street Fighter 4 is epic. I played the new Mortal Kombat revival, and I can tell you that's epic. And while I know Donkey Donkey Kong 64 has its fans and wasn't bad by any means, Donkey Kong Country Returns is overall a flat-out better game. 
Finally, at this point, it's even less fair to call the genre retro when it's expanded into areas and audiences with no frame of reference for what retro is supposed to mean. 90%, hell, probably higher than that, of iPhone, mobile, indie, and casual games are using a retro-style template simply because the stripped-down, basics-focused aesthetic suits them. There's a whole new generation of gamers coming in on simple pick-up-and-play stuff like Angry Birds or Plants vs. Zombies, which aside from their control scheme would have been right at home on an early 80s console or even the arcades. In the end, it's about the vitality of preserving our own history. Retro games are the seeds from which all the rest of this has sprung. Playing retro games gives us all a tangible, immediate connection to the evolution of the medium, while making retro-style games gives up-and-coming designers a hands-on understanding of the time-tested core concepts that are as true in Dragon Age today as they were in Berserk a long time ago. It's about... It's about... It's about respecting the past and holding on to it in order to carry the lessons of the classics into the here and now, making sure that we stay on the right track for the future. That's my mission. That's what I'm here to do. That's why I have to defeat the anti-thinker. guys with his elbows. Just give him back the fucking elephant. Oh, what now? Anti-thinker. Fuck me. What are you doing? Uh, uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm taking over the show, sir. Yeah, like you told me. I mean, you know, Take over the show, spread the gospel of anti-thought throughout the web. I mean, that was the plan, right? Yeah. No. What are you doing right now? He was only doing these things once every couple of weeks. All right? I had some downtime. Why have you not yet destroyed the Overthinker? <laughs> you don't need to worry about that, Chief. Yeah, I zapped him the Wario's woods. He doesn't have nearly the EXP needed to break any of the binding spells. By now, the wilderness has totally taken care of him for us, Chief. WRONG! Behold, yet he lives! No! No! That's not possible! Unless... Uh, he must have found the old man. He must not be allowed to return. The plan is far too close to completion to be uh, anti-thinker. Uh, yes, sir. Why are you still in human form? Oh, uh, I need to blend in. You know, uh, I mean, granted, there's no one else here at the time, but, you know, to fit in in this world. Enough! Oh, come on, man. I, I really like having these... And things. Transform out of that ridiculous disguise this instant, you miserable worm. All right, all right, all right.
That's more like it. Yes. A proper scion of the Antiverse. Yes, my master. The Overthinker. He has never seen your true form, has he? No, he has not. Excellent. You will go to Wario's Woods and confront the Overthinker in person, while he is still unaware of what manner of creature he truly faces. Yes. And there, I will destroy him once and for all. <laughs> ah.